Hello, welcome along to the show. Week five is almost upon us already here in the new National Football League season. A month has flown by. More drama, more big plays, more upsets than I can ever remember before in at the start of the NFL season. And what of the show against the line? Well, in an opening month that has been full of upsets, we have a winning record. We're eight and six against the line to this point. So we're bucking the trend, as you can probably see. Joining us this week, the return of the great Daggers, Charles Dagnall. Great to have you along with us once again for the ride, Daggers. Well, it's great to be back. I'd like to think you were probably 0-4 after the first week <laughs> where I joined you, and, and you've managed to you've managed to remedy things since I've not been with you. So I'm hoping that, you know, with the trend bucking, I'm certainly hoping that we can now continue on that upward curve. One thing I think, Richard, I don't know what you think, is that after, and of course, at the beginning of the season, you don't really know. I think what we've now found out is that we actually know less than that, given the first four weeks of the season. Absolutely. The, the amount of things that have happened, and it's been fabulous watching. It really has. I've been absolutely glued to the television over the Sundays and Monday nights, but we just don't know anything at the beginning of the season. But things are starting to kind of work their way out. Maybe so, maybe so. Um, the, the NFL prides itself of ha having a league of parity, doesn't it? And I think that's mm -hmm. what we've seen uh, more than ever before in the opening four weeks uh, of this season. Uh, I can't remember the exact statistic, but going to last uh, last week's preview show, there was something like 15, 16, what they call big underdogs, according to the bookmakers. And by that, I mean uh, teams that were five and a half point underdogs on the line or greater. Of those teams, nine of them uh, had beaten the spread. Two had won outright. It was unbelievable. Um, so that it, it's it's not been an easy easy opening four weeks. That's my defence, and therefore I'm claiming with pride that as a show we're doing well. But to, to yes. highlight what you were saying, the Chiefs and Vikings, the last two undefeated records in the NFL through four weeks. The Jacksonville Jaguars, a team everybody was tipping to to be a postseason contender. They're, they're still looking for their first win, mm. having gone down to the Texans last week. And then you remember Jared Goff, that bust that was hauled out of L.A. by the Rams and traded on to D Detroit. Well, we're recording this on Tuesday. Last night, Monday night football, Jared Goff not, not only throws touchdown passes, Charles, he now apparently catches touchdown passes. <laughs> Perfect. 18 of 18 leads the Lions to victory over the Seahawks. The world's gone mad. The world has gone mad, and I like a little bit of Detroit special in my life. I never get <laughs> yes. bored with it. We're seeing actually a, quite a few of these, these these plays, the lateral plays that we're seeing uh, as well, sort of caught on a 10-yard in, and then just, you know, these little bits of, um, uh, of fancy play calling just coming in in, in games around, around the league. Um, I liked the Philly special being done by Jerry Goff. I thought he – I watched it this morning. I, I tell you what, Daggers, though, what about the pass from Amon Ra St. Brown? Absolutely on the button. Oh, the touch was absolutely imperative. And he just arced it over the on Russian defender. Um, and, and it really was a, a beautiful touch pass from, pass from Amon Ra St. Bra, uh, St. Brown. Um, but I watched Detroit. I mean, Detroit, Goff hadn't quite seen himself. Uh, in the mm. first three weeks, there was just a little bit. Of, no, not that he was outlandishly bad. No, I just don't think the timing was quite there. But over the of course, I remember watching the game against Tampa Bay, my Bucks, um, and and I think partly a little bit of defensive disruption. I thought the Bucks defense was pretty good that day. Um, different looks, different schemes, and and Jared Goff. And early on in the season, when you're trying to get a bit of rhythm, and if Detroit start to find that rhythm as they did last night offensively. Whoa, watch out. Singletary and Jamar Gibbs. Jameson Williams is fit and firing, you know, celebrating 30 yards before he got to the end zone uh, on one little just crossing pattern that he that he ran yep. uh, and A got pace found to him. Amon Ra St. Brown as well. Um, Sam Laporta getting back more touches as well. They are, uh, they're, they're getting back to the kind of Detroit we, we knew from previous uh, last couple of seasons, really. So great to watch. Uh, it was, I thought that was a fantastic game of football, actually. I thought Seattle didn't yeah. do a great deal wrong. Um, but but fabulous games to watch. And yes, just sort of underlying the fact that we know nothing. 
Uh, and, <laughs> and for all of those there's, there's one other that. name. There's one other name I want to mention uh, before we start looking ahead to the week five action. Uh, and it's a team that hasn't had a lot of love on this show, frankly, because they've been awful through the four years that Graves on Gridiron uh, has been producing this yeah, podcast. And, and it is the Washington, Washington Commanders. Commanders. And how about in week one, we, I said to you, watch out for Jaden Daniels. He's my tip for offensive rookie of the year. Do you know through four weeks, Daggers, he's, at, he's got an 82% completion rate. That isn't just an NFL best through the opening four games of the season for a rookie quarterback. Mm-hmm. That is an NFL best for a quarterback through the opening four weeks of the season, period. And it's not like he's just making short dump off um, high percentage plays either. He's winging it deep. He's finding Terry McLaurin. And these commanders, three and one, they're top of the NFC East. They look, fa- this kid is special. And it's very difficult not to make the comparison with RG3 when he first, when Robert mm. Griffin first got drafted, that amazing rookie season that he had in Washington. And obviously the injury that set him back late in the season, and he was never quite the same again. And given how they used RG3, a lot of designed runs, understandably so, given the athlete that he was, though I'm sure is a temptation to do similar with Jaden Daniels. Look, no defences have seen him, really. They've seen a lot of his college work, but how you adapt into the NFL. And I think it can take a little bit of time. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that from CJ Stroud this year. Um, is that defences are lining up slightly differently. They're giving him different looks, more to think about. They've got a season's worth of footage on CJ Stroud. So when when it's, I think it's the same in a lot of sports, Richard, and you've covered a lot of sports in your time. I think when you first appear on the scene, I can equate it to cricket. When you've never seen a bowler before, he comes on and takes 50 wickets in his first season. Then batters now know about him. There's footage. You can know what he's doing. And that second season is always that little bit harder. Not saying they're going to struggle like CJ Stroud hasn't struggled, but I think there's not the pace that he was last year because no one had seen him. Jaden Daniels is a special, special player. Um, And I was going to ask you about him. And I wonder about the fact that a season ago, Bryce Young was the number one pick. Went to a terrible team in Carolina. Very few weapons, an awful offensive line. Pressure being the number one pick. Meanwhile, the number two pick, CJ Stroud, under the radar down in Houston. No one was expecting miracles, but he had just an amazing rookie season. Is there a similarity this year, perhaps, with Caleb Williams up in Chicago and Jaden Daniels being the number two pick, where those weren't necessarily focused as much as Williams, but that allows the number two with great deal of skill just to have the pressure eased off a little bit. Does that help, do you think? It can't It can't hinder, can it? Let's be honest. Um, what, what I do think, uh, just purely going on the eye test, I've always liked Jaden Daniels more than Caleb Williams, and especially the way he started this opening month of the season. He just looks like your stereotypical quarterback, but with mobility as well, because... OK, he, he's not a, a Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson type of character that is likely to rip off a 60-yard run and burn you with, with, with his legs. But he's just quick enough to make defensive players miss. And if you're already guarding against the pass and you leave that little ray of light, that corridor of light open, he is going to go straight through it and get your team a first down. I think what you've also got to to bear in mind when you talk about Um, certainly the Texans as well, is that the respective head coaches at Washington and Houston have put a run game in Mm. in place there as well. It's it's never been all about C.J. Stroud, although he's changed that narrative himself. Equally, this season never started with it being all about uh, Jaden Daniels. You have Brian Robinson in the backfield. They made the free agent veteran acquisition of Austin Eckler as well. And and I do think being able to play complementary football which is the invoke phrase these days, makes a massive difference. All too often in recent years, teams have gone into the draft, the number one pick, all the spotlight, the attention's on him. And if it doesn't happen overnight, well, it's, you know, the the instant society, the nature of the instant society we live in says, well, it's boom or bust. Well, I think what Dan Quinn's done well in Washington is just try and alleviate some of that pressure and then all of a sudden, from a team that started the year with low expectations, here you are with heads being turned. And just a brief 
point that I'll make on, on quarterbacks who are deemed to be a bust. Look at Sam Darnold now. Look at Geno yep. Smith now. These, I mean, okay, granted, both of them at the Jets, but so maybe there's something in that. Um, but both <laughs> of these quarterbacks who were written off went and spent a bit of time as backups, but actually in their latter years have, have sort of done their apprenticeship, are surrounded by slightly better environments and better weapons uh, for them to play with. And now they're seeming to flourish. So I don't like this instant. Mm. You know, Bryce Young could be. He could be. Now, I know he's not sure, but he's got nothing in Carolina. It needs Andy Dalton, who's 37 and a half million years old, to come in because he knows the league He's played in the league for, what, 14, 15 seasons, so he can adapt better than, a, a you know, a young 20, 20-year-old. 20 so I think that, you know, it, it, we, we do put a lot of pressure and onus on these young draft picks, especially high draft pick quarterbacks, to instantly work. And if they don't, to cast them aside. Well, not so fast. Yeah, I absolutely agree um, with you on that. So it's been a fantastic opening month to, to the new campaign. Here we go into October. It's the start of the London series of games as well. But because you're on the show once again, Daggers, we're going to have a rare foray into the Thursday night football matchup for those that managed to catch this pod before the game on Thursday. It is an NFC South battle. The Buccaneers at the Falcons. The Bucs are three and one. The Falcons two and two. Atlanta, I think by virtue of having home field advantage, start as narrow one and a half point favourites going into this game. But there's no point in me talking about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when I, I've got an avid Bucks fan on the show. So, Daggers, the floor is yours. Tell us about Baker Mayfield and Tampa Bay. Well, Tampa Bay are absolutely sensational this season, apart from when they're not. Um, <laughs> and this is the weird thing about Tampa Bay. I mean, look, they are solid enough. They have played three very, very good games of football. Um, they went up to Detroit and won in their house. That's a big, big victory. And then the following week, they get beaten at home by the Broncos. And it makes you wonder. It's a bit of a head scratcher as to what. Now, look, Sean Payton was always going to come back into Tampa Bay and cause us uh, an upset. I, I, you know, I like that man as a as a offensive scheme and an offensive brain. But as a Bucks fan, not massively given his history with the Saints. Um, I think. This stretch for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will genuinely, we will find out who they are. They, mm. We really will. They've got a tough run coming up. Two divisional road games, one at the Falcons, one at the Saints. Now, if they get out of that at one and one, I think they've done they've done pretty reasonably, and I, and I, I you know I'm sure the Bucks will hope for a two and zero. I think if you beat one division rival, both on the road, I think if you can get out of that of one and one, you're all right. That takes them to four and two, theoretically. I've already planned the season out, it would seem, Richard, haven't I? Um, and then you have got three weeks of the Ravens, Chiefs and 49ers. That is a hellish type That's of That's a gauntlet week. of a run. Yeah, it is. So you want to be in a position of a kind of, you know, five and one, four and two going into that. Now, the Saints have got the Chiefs this week. That can, you know, that's going to be a hard ask for them. So I think this game actually has a huge amount of importance riding on it. That said, I kind of like the spread on on the Falcons here, one and a half points. I think it'll be a relatively close game. There's lots of different factors. Been hugely impressed with the emergence of Bucky Irving uh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's running at 5.8 yards a carry. Uh, he's good out of the backfield with uh, with the hands. He's an outlet for Baker Mayfield. I don't think you have to worry about about Evans and Godwin, and they're doing their thing. They're they're you know they're having the K. Dotman's having a decent season as well. My biggest worry for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is their injury, um, their injuries at this moment in time. Now I've got to go to my phone, and the reason I'm going to my phone is because I've taken a screenshot. Look at of this, the prepared injuries that, they, injuries that they've got. So. Um, there's, if you go onto the NFL.com, they've got their injury reports. Everyone yeah. is a player, two players, maybe three players. The Bucks have got about 14 players here. Uh, so the worrying ones are across the defensive line, Greg Gaines, William Golston, uh, Logan Hall, Kalijah Kansi, Vita Vea, all limited or did not practice on uh, this week. Um, Antoine Winfield didn't practice again uh, with his foot injury. Then you've got four wide receivers who are questionable at the moment. Uh, Trey Palmer, concussion. Jalen McMillan, hamstring. 
Uh, Mike Evans didn't practice, but he should be okay to go against the Falcons. And then a couple of offensive linemen. Graham Barton, who I think has been a really good signing from, for, or draft pick uh, this year in the middle of the offensive line. Luke Goddicky and Tristan Wirth, Wirths are both limited. So injuries is the big one, Richard. I really think that um, this is something that the Buccaneers have to try and contend with. I want to see from a Falcons perspective, very difficult to see it from a Falcons perspective, being a Bucks fan. Um, <laughs> but I think you've got to ride your running backs. Kirk Cousins, four touchdowns, four interceptions, big contract. Maybe they feel that he's got to go out and win them games. But look at the talent, Richard, around him. Kyle Pitts, Drake London, Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier. I think if the Falcons can run the ball, I think they are going to have a pretty good night in the Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, Arena Dome. Arena Dome. Stadium. 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 Thank you very much. I knew it was Mercedes-Benz. That was probably that way. Um, the sponsors so I, will be pleased with you. Yeah, I, I. You know what? And I also look at the Falcons and their matches this year have been decided by eight points or less. Pittsburgh, they lost by eight points, but then since then they won against Philadelphia by a point. They won against New Orleans by two points. And Casey, they lost uh, by five points. That kicker, Young Way Ku, who's kicking everything from 50 to 65 yards. I, I, I just, I think it's going to be a close game. I think all of the ones that we're going to cover today are going to be close games. Uh, and I, I, I think as the spread goes at one and a half, I think that's, I, I would say that's in and around what I would have. How about you? How do you see it? Well, I, be, I, I, I'm, I can't, I'm trying to be neutral, but I'm failing miserably. Well, first up, I, I laid cards on the table at the start of the season. I took the Falcons to come out of the NFC South as champions. Yeah. I, I love the balance they've got uh, on offense and the weapons that are at Kirk Cousins' disposal. But like you also, I think the, the key to this game on Thursday night is the run game because you rarely see a good Thursday night football game. You only have three or four days to prepare for it. We saw it in New York last week with yeah. the Cowboys Giants. Awful game. Um, and you end up having it, you know, a bunch of field goals. And it's just not one for the purists. So if you can win on the ground, then you're winning this game. So you look at Tyler Algier. You look at Bijan Robinson too. Well, certainly Bijan Robinson, you've got a stud running back. Oh. And Tyler Algier is proving himself to be a more than competent uh, complementary piece to be Jan Robinson as well. That has been the knock on the the books um, for a good couple of years now. That they haven't really had a, a proficient run game, um, and and yet in Baker Mayfield they found somebody who's been able to more than compensate for that. I, and it's the the attitude he brings to the, yeah. to the field as well. So whilst you look at it on paper and say you've got these two guys that can run the ball, pound the rock for for the Atlanta Falcons. You've also got big Vita Vea in the heart of that defensive line for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And you talk about that one defeat this season against the Denver Broncos. On paper, it looks awful. But who was not in that game? Vita Vea. And that was de decisive. And you look at what happened last week. He comes back. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the Buccaneers shut down Jalen Hurts and the Eagles offense regardless of whether you have fit wide receivers or not for the Philadelphia Eagles. But for one run, you never heard anything from Saquon Barkley. Yeah. And that's who their offense runs through. Absolutely. And, and look, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I'm, I, look, I think the Bucs have got a very good opportunity to win. I understand what I'm saying is I understand why the spread is as it is at Falcons at 1.5. Um, I don't think it's too, too – I think it's going to be a very close game. And I think the Bucks can nick it because, like you say, Baker is cooking at the moment. He's got, again, great rhythm, great escapability in the pocket as well. His yep. awareness is excellent this season. Uh, and he's making plays from from nothing, even if they're just four or five yards, check downs and stuff, escaping from, from pressure. So I think it's going to be – I think it could be a decent – Thursday night game, actually, this. I think it, it could be reason. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be 45, you know, 45, 43, but I think it's going to be a high intensity divisional matchup. I think that's what they were hoping for last week with Dallas New, New York Giants, but I, I think it might be a decent game, this. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a bruising affair. And do you know what? I, well, no, no. I'm going to let you go first. You're the guest on the show. What are you going with? Uh, I am going with the Falcons. And I am at minus one point five. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, minus 1.5. I, I think they win it by a field goal, maybe. OK, well, right up, straight off the bat, we're going to disagree. I'm okay. going to take your Tampa Bay Buccaneers at plus 1.5. And do you know what? We've got history on this show, Daggers, because I remember taking the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as dogs at Houston last year when you, you discarded them, put them to the wayside, and the Bucs came good. Baker Mayfield led them. I think he does it again this Thursday night. Reverse psychology here, Richard. <laughs> Reverse psychology. I'm going to get us to four and one by picking against them. <laughs> right. Well, 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 Daggers works on his reverse psychology, and I try to <laughs> understand exactly what that means. We've got a whole host of Sunday games to look forward to, including the one in London at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Don't go away. We'll be back after these short messages. OK, welcome back to Graves on Gridiron, the week five preview show. We've taken a rare look into Thursday night football and we've got disagreement. Daggers takes the Atlanta Falcons to cover as one and a half point favourites. I'm not having any of it. I'm going to go where Daggers dares not. I'm taking Baker and the Bucks to go in there as underdogs and cover at plus 1.5. D- Daggers, I can't believe you've done it again. Uh, let <laughs> Let's look ahead to this Sunday's games. We've got three to look at for you. We start with the first game on Sunday and we're going to finish with Sunday night football. Let's start at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, London. The 2-2 two and two Jets taking on the undefeated 4-0 and o Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings, unsurprisingly, are favourites. Two and a half point favourites on the line going into this. But who, if anybody, at the start of this season said that the Sam Darnold Vikings would be one of only two undefeated teams remaining after the first four weeks of the season? I had no doubts, Richard, <laughs> that they would be 4-0. Uh, obviously, only those who know a great deal. Uh, but I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. I couldn't be happier for Sam Darnold. I really mm. couldn't, because here is a quarterback, as we've talked about earlier, that has done his hardship at the, at the New York Gents, went to Carolina uh, for the season, went to the San Francisco 49ers as backup predominantly, and now has found a home only because of the injury to J.J. McCarthy, yeah. their number one pick. Now, whether he would have started anyway, but I'm just really, really pleased. And he's still young. Sam Darnold is still... And the other thing, you know, is that this starts no fluke. You, you look at some of the teams they've beaten in the opening month of the season. Home to the San Francisco 49ers. Home to CJ Stroud and the Texans. <laughs> and then last week, they march into their nemesis arch rivals, Lambeau Field. Jordan oh. Love's back. Everybody's up. And they handled the Green Bay Packers. I don't mm-hmm. care what anybody wants to say about the late rally and comeback. They were 28 nothing up in Lambeau Field. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and like I'd sort of, I realized that the, the Packers came back and, and, you know, it was maybe a little bit of a worry towards the, towards the back end, but kind of, I'd, I'd sort of ignored that game after, after the game the was over. But yeah. Given also what's happening defensively, but this is one of these games, Richard, against this New York Jets. I, the, I look at all of the statistics and I've been having a look around. I've written a load down and I, and there's certain things I don't understand. Similarly, on a game that, that we'll be covering in a minute. You look at the Jets, their defense allowing 15.5 points a game. That's fifth in the league. The Viking defense is allowing 14, 14.8, which is fourth in the league. So this is two high quality yep. defenses going up against each other. Now, if the New York Jets need a roadmap in this game, have a look at this next set of stats. They are second. Are the Jets? Uh, are the, um, uh, the, the they're second in rush defense. The Vikings. They're second in the yeah. league in rush defense. They are dead last in pass defense. So if there is a roadmap for you, Brees Hall can't run it at the moment. He's having a shocker. Three point one yards a carry. He he can't get anything going on the ground. So if Aaron Rodgers and Nathaniel Hackett want to try and pull one over on the Minnesota Vikings and match match them, which is not going to be easy against that Jet defense, pass the damn ball. Get something going through the air. Garrett Wilson, but, Mike yeah, Williams. Here's, here's the kicker to that. that. There's a problem with that argument because whichever way you, you mash this up, Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers through the first four games of the season are just not singing from the same no. hymn sheet. It was obvious last week. There was a couple of times you saw Rogers speaking to all his receiving cores. 
look, if, if you can see pressure coming, I need you to snap off your route and, and make yourself available. You had false starts. How many flags oh. went, went down in that game? Aaron Rodgers' hard counts offensive line. He well, hard, he's the best in the league. And th this was really interesting. Post-game, I don't know if you saw any of the comments. Nah. Oh, yeah. Robert Sala, the head coach, is asked about it, and he gives uh, an answer which I found really hard to understand, which effectively said, well, maybe as an offensive line with some new pieces involved, we're just not quite there yet with the cadence, and we need, need to pair that back. Well, needless to say, you and I both work in the media. Aaron Rodgers comes into the room immediately. Well, Robert Sala says maybe you need to pair back the cadence. Aaron Rodgers, the, the look on his face, oh, oh. It, it, his main weapon, uh, needless to say, there will be no pairing back of the cadence. It, it really interesting. The one word he used was accountability. accountability. Maybe we need to be more accountable. And mm -hmm. that goes for the offensive linemen uh, as well, because we're not talking rookies necessarily. There are veterans in that, that offensive line. And as you yeah. said, there was no issue with Morgan Moses um, in the previous three weeks. So I, I, I can... I think it'll be an interesting flight over to London this week. I, I just wrote down tension. Tension between Salah and Rogers. And from that press conference, obviously, when you've got one person coming in yeah. and the next, there was that little, it was a couple of weeks ago where Salah went for a hug and Rogers sort of just fired yeah. him off a little bit um, as well. So maybe there's something brewing that the only way to overcome tension is by getting W's. And that's yeah. that's one way to, to and maybe it's a kind of getting to know each other period. Last year didn't happen the way that they thought, and so perhaps there's there's a few teething problems um, from a Jets perspective. But they've got to get something going. And obviously, the best friend of the passing game is a good running game, but they haven't got that. And everything I was expecting a big year from Bruce Hall uh, that has not I still materialized. am. Not I, I still am. Yet, I, though, has I, it? it it has not. Um, I I think. Obviously, the, the offensive line woes last week particularly. And what was, look, make, make no mistake about it, the conditions were awful. And mm. I know that was the same for both sides. But at half time, I think I'm correct in saying Bo Nix, the quarterback for the Denver Broncos, had minus seven total passing yards. <laughs> and yet they somehow put the only drive of significance together of the game. They score a touchdown. That turns out to be enough. But let's not forget, whilst everybody's getting on the New York, New York Jets right now, Despite all their woes last week, they still had a field goal opportunity to win the game. And in, yeah. in an era when, you know, nobody thinks twice about making a field goal from 50 yards, Greg the leg shoves it right. And it's, you know, it's a, in the loss column. Uh, I, look, I think this is an interesting game. I, yeah. I think the Vikings are right, rightfully high now. I think the Jets have got a lot to prove. So how do we see this going? Well, I went first last time, Richard Graves. <laughs> <laughs> I know your game. So, somebody I seems know to your game. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we've got the Vikings as two and a half point favorites. They've beaten some stiff competition this year. Justin Jefferson and Sam Darnold have been playing well. But there's always something unexpected around the corner in the National Football League. I think a trip across the pond to London might be just the thing. There's no on look, in facts, there's no reason for this at all. But I think having heard everything we've heard come out of New Jersey this week, Aaron Rodgers, his demeanor, his expectation, the talent they've got on that roster, it's go time now for the New York Jets. Put up or shut up, and there's no better time or place to do it than London against an undefeated team. I'm taking the Jets as two and a half point underdogs. And I I'm right there with you. I think it has to end <laughs> sooner or later. Uh, I, I do. I think. I think. You know, there are only two undefeated teams uh, left in in the um, in the NFL. Minnesota Vikings being one of them. Your time will come. We're not in the era of perfect seasons yep. anymore. And and you know, I think the 1972 Dolphins are safe uh, for the rest of time. I'd be astonished. Uh, if uh, if anyone could go undefeated, especially in now a seventeen, potentially in the future eighteen week season, I think that's I think that's safe. Your loss is going to come somewhere, somewhere different, a different environment can I think help the New York Jets and just bring them together. Away trips actually sort of send, yep. tend to do that with sports teams. Um, I'm with you. I'm looking at the weather. Light rain and a moderate breeze. Uh, and I think that will suit the New York Jets rather than the usually domed, even though they went up to Lambeau, conditions were perfect 
up there in Lambeau. If, you, the, if you're the, going to Lambeau, you want to go in September. Yeah, very much so. And I think that's that's what the Minnesota Vikings face. I think, yeah, I, I don't necessarily think it's the, the week that the Jets thoroughly get it together, but I think that defense is that good. And I think it can just, it's the first one really, the Minnesota Vikings, I think will come up against where they have been truly, truly tested. Uh, they are a stiff D of the New York Jets. And uh, yeah, I quite fancy them this week. And I can hear Vikings fans now saying you haven't even spoken about um, Aaron Jones and the run game. I hear you. But like I say, th this is just an eye test for me. It's a gut feeling. And I'm going to take the Jets. Daggers is with us. The Jets are two and a half point underdogs. Yeah. We've got them in, in London on Sunday. OK, let's move back to Texas then. The Houston Texans at home to the Buffalo Bills. Two, three and one teams. The, the odds makers cannot divide these two by a slip of paper. The Texans are one-point favourites going into it. Um, part of that will be, obviously, home field advantage. Part of it will be the crushing loss on Sunday night football that mm. the Bills suffered at the hands of the Ravens last weekend. And, and that really was as comprehensive as it goes. I think we expected a, an entertaining game. I don't think anybody predicted it would be as one-sided as it turned out to be especially given the fact that I said keep Derek Henry in the garage until around about November. They didn't listen. Ignore that, ignore <laughs> that Baltimore. Just ignore that. And rightly, they have done. They have not called on me. John Harbaugh's not been ringing me up and sort of saying, what, do we, what should we do with Derek Henry? Just leave him where he is, old son. Another 200 yards later on, on uh, primetime football and uh, and I've been proved wrong yet again. Look, I, this, I know the odds maker. I'm looking again, I'm looking at stats and... And I'm looking at these, the, you know, the Bills, they're just completely the wrong way around. The Bills have been yeah. great. They really have been great because a lot was spoken pre-season about the weapons available to, to Josh Allen, the, the fact that they didn't really draft many. The supporting cast hasn't been great. They have found a way. They have found a way to win. And I like what the Bills have done over the first three weeks. I think when you get a rampant running game like the Baltimore Ravens, who were due, Really, they showed signs of it against the Cowboys of what they are capable, and they really put it to all to work on um, the game against um, against the Bills last uh, last week. But you look at the Bills, Richard, and they're twentieth in passing, they're seventeenth in rushing, rushing, but second in points per game. They're averaging thirty points per game. So I had a look a bit deeper. Plus five turnovers. For the mm. Bills this year, they're plus five. So they're getting the ball from, from the opposition, but they're getting it with short fields to work with as well. And I think that is one major part, especially without um, uh, without uh, Terrell Bernard, without Matt Milano in the middle of those linebacking, uh, their, their linebacking court is weak. So hence why there was possibly the reason that the Baltimore ran. But I like what they have done over the first three weeks. I think the Baltimore game's a bit of a blip. Um, but they face a Texans team, which, again, I can't quite decipher. Can you? Just to hold fire there before we talk about Texans, because I'm going to turn around to you and disagree a little bit on the Bills, because what's that well-known phrase? There are lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> are Every... you calling me a liar, Richard Graves? <laughs> I'm sa I'm, all I'm saying, Daggers, is you've just reeled off a load of statistics to me. Right. Um, I, I, and whilst they were 3-0 and through the first three weeks, one of those wins was against a heavily depleted Miami Dolphins team. Mm -hmm. Another of those wins, they were being drilled at home week one by Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals yes, they before were. they came out That's in the second fine. half. Yeah. Josh Allen put this team on his back. Mm -hmm. He ran for a touchdown. He threw for some touchdowns. It was almost a one-man wrecking machine, and they get out of there with, with the win. You, you look at James Cook as a running back, and you say, oh, four and a half yards per carry. Look mm -hmm. at this. The Bills have got a running game. Through four weeks, he's only got 227 total yards yeah. on the ground. And, oh, and so, oh, oh, what's this? Is this statistics you're throwing at me? Well, is these statistics? It, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we it, go. This is why I'm saying there are <laughs> lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> I, I don't think the Bills are as good as that three and one record suggests they are. And they don't get the turnovers week four in Baltimore, and Baltimore run riot all over them. Now, what you will say is Derrick Henry shone in that game. Lamar mm -hmm. Jackson had a great game. Well, watch out, Houston, because Joe Mixon's dinged up with an ankle. Damian Pierce hasn't been available, um, certainly last week. 
and you've been relying on Cam Akers, who's only averaging 3.7 yards per carry. So you don't necessarily have that run game. That being said, you've just turned around and, and told me that, well, I like the Bills because they've found ways to win games. Well, the trip to the Vikings aside, the Houston Texans have done exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. And I think that goes a long way to explaining why there's a, just a slip of paper in this line that's been laid by the odds makers. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with you. And, and, and it's the finding ways to win. And that does show the core of a good team and a well-coached team. Yep. Uh, as, as well, and you look at the weapons. I mean, if you're talking weapons and we're talking paper, you look at Tank Dell, you look at Nico Collins, um, you look at Stefan Diggs, and you know, Stefan Diggs revenge game, by the way. Um, but <laughs> but you look at what's there available to the Houston Texans, and you would say, well, that should surely outshine what the Bills have to play with as well. But as you say, they have Josh Allen, who can put his team, put the team on his back. Yeah. But they have a defense that can make plays, and they can make plays. Yes, they're without some serious linebackers, but but they have got a very well schemed Sean McDermott defense. So, I, I, when, what my point was when you look at the numbers, not everything kind of makes sense. Nico Collins leading none receiver of it makes in, sense. Yeah, Nico Collins leading receiver in in the NFL, but they're scoring twenty points a game. But they're finding ways to win. Our, as our Buffalo. I don't I, I I can't call this one. If I had to, if I had to, I'd have to go. You are going to have to. Well, yeah, I know. You're gonna make me aren't you? <laughs> um well well if I don't know if it's time to pick yet, but but I am leaning towards Buffalo. I think they'll be hurting from the way that Baltimore dealt with them uh that night. Uh I think they are a team that can overcome that. I think they, I think they've got the character within there, um, and I just, I've not seen the Texans fire as yet. I think they've got, they've got to run the ball. They've got to try and run the ball. They'll be desperately hoping Joe Mixon can make it uh, to game day. I think he's day to day now. I'm not quite sure, but um, it's again, it's going to be one that is going to be firmly on my watch list because, because I think it could be a belter. Well, I, I'm gonna judge this game. We're recording this on Tuesday, so there's five days to go before they play. Um, as it stands right now, I don't think Joe Mixon plays. That could change right. between now and then. Right. So the, the premise uh, of my pick is going to be on the basis that Joe Mixon doesn't play, and it comes down to a battle of quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. CJ Stroud a, against um, Josh Allen. I love the Texans. I think that they're a great team oh, when everybody's healthy. Yeah. I like the fact they've got home field advantage. I love the fact that despite everything, they've found ways to win games through the opening four weeks. But here comes the caveat. Whilst they have the number five overall ranked defense and the fourth against the pass, they're still giving up 23 and a half points a game. That's in the bottom 10 in the National Football League. Mm. They're only scoring a lick under 20 points a game themselves. You've said... Despite um, all the statistics, the Bills are putting up over 30 points a game here. And Josh Allen is the primary cause for, for all that. So if you're telling me that one man has to make a difference, Josh Allen is that man. Yeah. So that, that in mind, given what we know at the time of recording, I'm taking the Buffalo Bills as one point favorites to win and cover this spread. How about you? Yeah, I'm with you. I, 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 I just I look at it. Purely, and you're looking at an elite quarterback and someone who is just on the borderline of being elite and will become so. And if you're asking me to pick a QB to 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 manage a game for you or to, to go out and win you a game, and I say, like you say, there's a slip of paper between these two teams. I really do believe that. I'm going to always side with Josh Allen just now. In two or three years' time, that might be different, but I'm going to side with Josh Allen, and I am taking the Buffalo Bills. We, we are of a kind opinion here in the first two games from Sunday's previews. Yeah, yeah. This, this, could, this, all, is this could all fall apart massively <laughs> now. Let's the, see. Dangerous territory. We've got <laughs> one more game to come. It's the Sunday night football clash between the Cowboys and the Steelers. It'll be with you after these few short messages. Don't go away. Okay, welcome back to the week five preview of Graves on Gridiron. As you might, if you're watching on YouTube, you've seen Daggers. That het up about the games we've looked at so far. He's had to take on hydration to get ready to. for the Sunday night football clash. Um, just to remind you, uh, the Bucks falcons Thursday night football, 
we disagree. I've got the Bucks as one and a half point underdogs. The Falcons are the pick for Daggers as one and a half point favorites. That being said, the two games we've taken on Sunday so far, Jets-Vikings, we both agree. The Jets turn it around as two and a half point dogs in London. They cover that spread. And equally, Bills at Texans, the Bills are one point favorites. They get back to winning ways, having suffered that bone crushing defeat at Baltimore last Sunday night. The final game on this week's preview pod takes us to Sunday night football once again. It's an old fashioned rivalry of historic proportions. The Cowboys against the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Cowboys two and two, Steelers three and one, but Pittsburgh coming off a defeat in Indy last weekend. The line has the Steelers as two and a half point favorites. Charles Dagnall, what do you see happening? I don't think this is going to be like one where you're getting through 10 b- bags of popcorn and you're just there <laughs> watching and just putting, this is, oh, this is amazing. This, oh, I can't get, oh, another another 93-yard touchdown. Oh, what a run. You're not getting your popcorn out. ready. No, I'm not getting my popcorn. What I think this is just a sort of brandy. You're just you're rolling around a brandy in a glass and just thinking, yes, if you're like a, a fairly low-scoring sort of knockdown, drag-out affair, this this could be right up your street. Um, I don't think this is going to be the sexiest game in the world. And the reason I say this is that, you know, the Steelers don't score many points, nor do they give many away. Dallas, I don't think have, well, I, I, you know, offensively, yeah, Dax throwing up great numbers, but they've got no running game. Um, I think Dead last in the National Football League when running the ball this season. When running the ball. And you're going to be without Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence. And they're unlikely to play uh, come Sunday. That is a big, big factor. Yeah. Steelers at home as well against the Dallas side who have got to look, be looking, you know, in their NFC East. You know, looking at Philly, looking at the Washington Commanders and the pressure now on. You know the Cowboys more, much more closely. I watched, um, I watched an episode of Pardon the Interruption. Uh, Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon, and on, on, I was listening to, I say, listen to the podcast. Anthony McFarlane, Booger McFarlane, was asked about the Dallas defense, and he came out and called them out and called them soft. He says they are soft. People are running all over them. There is not that Micah Parsons hasn't been able to really take hold of a game and win and get properly stuck in and, and put that defense on his back, and he's not going to be available for, for Sunday's game. Um, I don't worry you as a Cowboys fan at this moment in time, but two and two. <laughs> and the, the one saving grace I will say, Cowboys coming off 10 days rest. So so they've yep. had a, a decent rest up into this. But where, where do you sit as a Cowboys fan so far at two and two? T- 10 days rest certainly plays into their favour. What also plays into their favour is that they went on the road on a short week in Thursday night football. And it wasn't sexy, but in mm. a must-win game, they found a way to win. And to the credit, because there was a lot of heat on this defense in Dallas. There still is, to, to be honest. But certainly going into that trip to the Giants, can't stop the run. Baltimore's run all over you. The New Orleans Saints have run all over you. You go on the road on a short week and you restrict the lead running back, Devin Singletree, to 1.1 yards per carry. Now, look, nobody's saying the New York Giants offense or running game is a Super Bowl contending mm. offense. But I don't care who you are. If you can go into somebody else's house in the National Football League and you restrict them to 1.1 yards per carry on the ground, that is good. That is excellent. So for, from that perspective, at a time when you feared, well, is this a fractured locker room? Could it all be about to fall apart? They found a way to come together and put something on paper that was to their credit. Now, again, there's always two sides to every coin. The flip side to that is Daniel Jones had every opportunity to force this Cowboys defense to back off and make plays downfield. He had open receivers and he flat out missed them. He underthrew several. He he just was inaccurate on on a couple more. Uh, And that, you know, look, nobody's going to apologize for for getting a win on on the road. But I think that certainly helped Dallas. now you throw into the equation, you're going into a city that is rekindling thoughts and memories of the Steel Curtain defense mm-hmm. that's played lights out um, through the course of, of this season. Uh, 
and you're you're going there without your arguably best two defensive linemen in Demarcus Lawrence and Mike Parsons. <laughs> you're you're relying on a rookie defensive end in Neeland. Chauncey Goldson is your other one, and then the backups. I'm not even sure I know their names off the top, top of my head. So, <laughs> so so you've got problems. Your only hope is the 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 quarterback position is a problem area for the Pittsburgh Steelers to the point where after last week's outing in Indy, Russell Wilson's now available to to be active on game day. Does Justin Fields keep his job? You'd think so. They're three and one to start yeah. the season. Yeah. But to this point, Mike Tomlin hasn't committed to that. I agree. And I think if there is another kind of performance, even in victory for Justin Fields, even if the, the, the Steelers win, I think if Justin Fields isn't more than serviceable, I think then the conversations will start. I think even if they win the game, because it's not as though the Pittsburgh Steelers are lighting up. And, and look, frustrations will start to build. I don't care who you are. If you are George Pickens, who is, you know, wide receiver, they like to talk and they want to get fed. They want their touches. And if they're not necessarily getting them, they're, they're going to call that out. Now, it's easier to, to, you know, be quiet on a three and one team. But if that three and one becomes three and two, I think then the rumbling start and you have genuinely a more experienced and a, a heavily CV'd quarterback in Russell Wilson. Whether that's a good thing for a Steelers, whether you want to cause that controversy, I don't know. One thing I, I will say, is that it is Sunday night, it's in Pittsburgh, it's prime time, and that's when stars show up. And that is where I feel TJ Watt is going to make an absolute... He is doing the role that Micah Parsons should have yep. been doing for that Dallas defence. They are, for me, equivalent stars on defence. Um, I would argue that Micah Parsons has probably a few more tools than TJ Watt. It's just that... TJ Watt. That's a is, big call. <laughs> I think he do, I think he's got a few. I think he's. I think he's slightly speedier. I think he he's he drops. You know, obviously they're slightly different roles. Granted, is it, isn't just, TJ Watt the reigning defensive player of the year? Yeah, but I still think Micah Parsons. If, if you want, to, if you ask me, who I'd want on that side, on on my side, I'd want Micah Parsons. I think he does a few more things. I think he's that good. I think he can take a game over by himself. Uh, TJ Watt is still. We're talking one and one A. That's yeah. what we're. That's what we're looking at um, in this particular game. And and so, I I I just think TJ Watt might come out to play, and I think he might come and cause Dak Prescott. And I think Dak's got to go to release that ball pretty quick. Um, I like what they've been doing with Rico Dowdle. I like what they used him uh, on Thursday night against the Giants. I think you've got to turn to him. Zeke's giving you nothing. Um, so, so I, 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 I'm, I'm leaning Steelers way. Uh, I, I, I am, and, and, and I don't think That's it's two and a half point favorite staggers. Yeah, and, and I, and I'm, I'm covering that. I think that that they are, um, again, decent kicker and cricket. But I mean, here, here we go. Brandon Aubrey might just kick the Cowboys to to victory from his own thirty yard line because that dude doesn't <laughs> miss. From whatever the distance, he's just like, yeah, just I'll just stick it through. A 50-yarder is a chip shot for this guy. Um, so I, I lean towards the Steelers in this. I don't think it's going to be high scoring. I don't. I think it's going to be very, very close. Um, but again, it's another one of these games where we will find out who these teams are. Are the Cowboys soft? Are they? Are the Steelers able to generate any kind of offense? So I think this, under the spotlight of Sunday Night Football, I think we're going to learn a lot. Well, well, here's the thing. A little earlier in the show, you talked about the gauntlet run that was facing the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers yeah. on their upcoming schedule. Well, listen to this run leading into the, the bye week for the Cowboys. Steelers on the road this week, home to the Lions, on the road at the San Francisco 49ers. Mm. And you're going to do that, certainly without Demarcus Lawrence. I don't think he's back till November. Yeah. It's... I, I wouldn't right now rule out Micah Parsons on Sunday night, but a high ankle sprain, I'd say it's highly unlikely. So that's usually a four to six week recovery time. Yeah. Um, he might come back earlier than that, but how fit would he be in that instance is open to conjecture. So you're down your two starting defensive ends. Darren Bland, one of your starting corners, he's out as well. They lost one of the backups, the, the rookie corner, Carlson, on 
uh, last Thursday night. It remains to be seen what his status is for for the game. Um, so I sort of think that if Dallas are to, to win this game, they probably have to score at least 26 points. Mm. So it's really on Dak and C.D. Lamb because you ain't running the ball on this Pittsburgh Steelers defense. Nope. But, and, and when you take all of that into account, we've we've seen Dak and C.D. have a connection before. And you saw the, um, the, the Indianapolis Colts were able to make plays downfield last week um, to Pittman. Their, their star wide receiver against the Steelers defense. But I think it's asking a lot to be able to do it against Pittsburgh in their house when you know that your defense, it, it it's not even hobbling on three wheels. It's probably down to its last wheel <laughs> right now. Um, and I just think that, you know, yes, people point out that the horror of a fumble that Justin Fields had last week, which if he doesn't make, who knows, they might have come all the way back and won that game in, in Indianapolis. But in the first three weeks, we've seen him be able to make enough plays and grow as an NFL quarterback mm-hmm. for you to say, well, he, this guy could actually be serviceable. Um, and when you look at what he's going up against, what he's facing across from him on the field it, and how depleted Dallas are, I think he's got enough. You know, he's got Najee Harris in the, in the backfield as well. Two and a half point favorites, Sunday night football. If Dallas get behind, they haven't showed us yet that they have that ability to come all the way back. And until they do, I can't ride with them. I'm taking the Steelers to win this game and cover at minus two and a half as well. That's three games on Sunday, Daggers. We agree on all of them. We agree. Hey, we will be nine and six. I'm telling you now, not nine and six, 11 and six. We'll be 11 <laughs> and six going, going into week six. So uh, so I am I'm confident. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, I'm... I'm I want I want the Cowboys to just to finally from from me on this. I want the Cowboys to come out and show us that they're not soft. If you can go into Pittsburgh and win, given your injury situation, then more power. That to changes you. the narrative. That changes the narrative completely, and and then people stop asking that questions. If they fold like a badly made souffle, which I'm worried that they will, I think they're going to be very very tough questions being asked. Well, we will we, we will find out on Sunday Night Football. Just to recap then, uh, four games taken this week, including Thursday Night Football. Difference of opinion for Thursday night. I've got the Bucks to cover it, plus one and a half point underdogs. Dagger says, no, no, no. The Bucks might be my team, but they ain't winning in Atlanta. He's taking the Falcons to cover with his reverse psychology at <laughs> minus 1.5. Then on to Sunday at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, Jets, Vikings, we're both agreed that the Jets turn around this ship. They're two and a half point underdogs. They cover against the undefeated Vikings. On to Houston, where the Texans go into that game against the Buffalo Bills as one point underdogs. It might only be a slim margin. They don't get the job done. Take the Bills at minus one before we finish on Sunday Night Football, an old fashioned rivalry of historic proportions. Cowboys, Steelers, Pittsburgh at three and one are two and a half point favorites. Make that four and one because they win and cover at minus 2.5. As always, you can hit us up on social media at Richard Graves one on X, RDG Media UK Instagram, Graves on Gridiron on Facebook, or equally, if you want to read about the games we've discussed this week, then go over to my website, www.rdgmedia.uk. That's the one, Daggers. Click on that Talking Sport tab, and there you'll see um, NFL Week 5, Overcoming the Odds, three games to watch but there's four this week daggers what are you up to where can we find you next on our tv sets uh you can find me resting uh I, I, do you know what i'm wearing this i'm wearing this 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 big thick gel it's freaking freezing in this house winter's coming it, it's really really very cold um but uh i'm no I'm, I'm taking a little break it was a busy summer and that has allowed me to obviously envelop myself in the NFL, which I'm just in. It, my, my partner's not very happy. She's not very delighted at all, but I'm loving it. It's her. all in the small print, Daggers. It, it totally is. I told her this <laughs> before we got together. Sunday nights, six o'clock, you won't see me. Um, but no, just resting up. Uh, the Women's World Cup starts um, yep. uh, in a couple of days' time. I will be pretty much glued to that, cover a lot of the women's game. Um, sad not to be out there, but I will be keeping tabs uh, on uh, on proceedings out there. 
uh, with my, my podcast partner Lydia Greenway. Uh, we do we do a, a cricket podcast. Sorry for no, no. It. Tell uh, the cricket we, fans where they can we, catch that because it's a good yeah, podcast. We, uh, yeah, it's it's at daggers it's at daggers and lids on uh, YouTube. We have our YouTube channel, and it's basically if you like your women's cricket, we cover it um, uh, cover it to its as uh, fullest extent. Um, but or you can just follow me on on social media at Charles Dagnall. But uh, but yeah, so just going to be doing some podcasts with with lids as she is out there uh, in Dubai. Can't wait for that to kick off and uh, and see how it all pans out, and then off to the United States for a holiday in a couple of weeks' time. So, uh, so yeah. Jet set a lifestyle. It's, uh, it is. And, and I'm trying to talk my partner around going to a game. Uh, but but leave that do one it, with do me. Do it, do it, do it. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Look forward to it. You've just reminded me, actually. I, I actually, can you believe it? I missed out a social media link, despite that whole raft of them. Absolutely. You can watch this on YouTube. Richard yes. Graves TV. Just click on the button. Watch us there. Daggers. Delighted to have you on again. We will do it on several more occasions throughout the course of this season. Uh, one of these days, you'll agree with me that the Bucks are a good team. I can't do it just yet, though. I can't do it just yet. <laughs> when, when, we, when we raise the Vince Lombardi, then I might just lean your way. Great to talk All to right, you. Always great fun, Richard. Thanks for having me on. An absolute blast, as always. Say goodbye, Daggers. Goodbye, Daggers. There you go. Charles Dagnall. Enjoy week five, folks. So long, everybody.